The anime begins with Rick, a man in his 30s, undergoing intense training. His instructors note his significant improvement over the past two years, suggesting that the upcoming E-rank exam should be easy for him. They even worry that he might be too strong for the exam. But Rick humbly replies that he's still far from matching his teacher's prowess. The scene shifts to a bustling city's adventurer's guild, where adventurers are registering for the E-rank promotion exam. Where the receptionist hands out exam tickets, and Rick signs up too. He recognizes the receptionist as Elisa, a former colleague from when they both worked as guild receptionists two years ago. However, Rick is surprised to see her in this city, and Elisa is equally surprised that he quit his receptionist job so abruptly. She was even more shocked to learn that he had switched careers to become an adventurer. But Rick acknowledges that it seems absurd for a man his age to start adventuring as it's typically a young person's pursuit. However, their conversation is interrupted by a rude, drunken man who tries to persuade Elisa to go out drinking with him. Despite her polite refusals, he persists and attempts to force her. Seeing this, Rick intervenes, urging the man to calm down, but the drunkard suddenly faints. Rick then lays him down, attributing his collapse to excessive drinking, and advises caution with drinking. Elisa soon hands Rick his exam ticket, and he notices that his number is 4242, which makes him uneasy due to its unlucky connotation. Leaving the guild, Rick encounters a girl named Renette outside. Initially, he's too distracted by staring at her Mount Everest to notice her face, but when he does, he sees an attractive elf. However, back at the guild, some adventurers notice a palm-shaped imprint on the drunken man's armor. They wonder how anyone could bend steel like that and recognize the man as a former A-rank adventurer wanted for assault. But Elisa speculates that Rick might be responsible for the imprint. The scene then shifts to Rick undergoing a physical examination before the exam, surprising the doctor with his age of 32. The next test then measures the candidate's magic power using a crystal that lights up based on their power level. One by one, the examinees take their turns, achieving decent results. However, when Rick's turn comes, the crystal emits a dim light barely brighter than a candle flicker. This causes the other candidates to mock him, believing they've never seen someone so weak. But to their surprise, after Rick leaves, the crystal shatters. The scene soon transitions to the next test, where the examiner explains that they must hit a slime bag with all their strength to measure their offensive capability. They are allowed to use any type of attack, as the slime bag can absorb high impacts. But this made Rick recall his training, where his master told him that true strength lies in one's body, and that to build a reliable body, he must destroy a golden slime bag with his bare fists. Rick noted that golden slime bags are as tough as a dragon's fang, and no human could possibly break them with their fists. However, Rick's crazy master insisted that such feats were normal for any adventurer. Demonstrating his own prowess, he effortlessly destroyed a bag with just a touch, boasting that he could obliterate 200 of them simultaneously. He then commanded Rick to punch the bags 50,000 times daily as part of his training regimen. Soon, the examinees then take turns punching the slime bag with the examiner assessing their abilities based on the impact they make. Next up is Freed, a cocky noble, and the other examinees recognize him as the second son of the Diarmut family, regarding him as a genius. He makes a grand display of his magic but only manages to create a small flame that is smaller than your willy to hit the slime bag. Despite this, he maintains an arrogant demeanor, and the examiner also praises him as a genius. Rick, however, doubts whether the magic used was truly third-class pyromagic, recalling the vastly more powerful fire spells of one of his teachers. However, he considers the possibility that Freed condensed his spell to suit the indoor setting, acknowledging the skill involved. The other examinees continue their tests, and Rick is amazed by the green slime bag's ability to absorb so much damage. But when it's his turn, the examiner, noting Rick's age, comments that an adult's mana doesn't grow, and his mana measurement results were terrible. He advises Rick to quit adventuring, a sentiment shared by others in the room. Despite knowing all this, Rick refuses to give up, recalling his arduous training where he persevered even after hitting the golden slime bag 20,000 times. Determined to prove himself, he accidentally bursts the slime bag with a single punch, shocking everyone in the room. They soon move on to the next test where Rick impresses everyone by surviving the examiner's attack. Astounded, Freed admits to himself that even he couldn't block a fourth level spell, yet Rick did it with ease. The examiner commends Rick, amazed that he blocked the attack with first level defensive magic. But when the examiner announces he'll use a fifth level spell and urges Rick to use a higher tier spell to defend, Rick admits he can only use level one offensive and defensive magic. Surprised by Rick's precise mana control, the examiner is nonetheless annoyed and decides to go all out chanting a powerful 5th level spell, which Rick blocked with ease. However, a first-ranked knight named Sylvester, having noticed the spell from afar, arrives at the exam venue. 
He questions the use of high-level spells in an E-rank promotion exam, and the examiners explain that an F-rank adventurer had sent a green slime bag flying with his bare hands, even blocking his fifth-level magic with a first-level spell. Initially, Sylvester finds this hard to believe until he reviews Rick's information. Discovering that Rick worked as a receptionist at the Tiger Road Guild branch for 14 years, wondering if receptionist is a title for dragon slayers, but is disappointed to learn otherwise. Later, Rick takes the written test and, upon finishing, meets up with Rianette. She asks how his exam went, and he confidently says he should get full marks. She thinks this is expected given his 14 years as a guild receptionist. However, Rick remains uncertain about passing the practical exams as his mana was ranked F-. Rianette reassures Rick that he should be fine given his astonishing growth over the last two years. Suddenly, the cocky brat from earlier approaches, but Rick can't seem to remember his name and the brat reintroduces himself as Freed Diramut. Confused, he asks if he's lost Andring Freed who accuses Rick of ruining his chance to showcase his greatness through the exam. The boy soon starts crying and his sister Angelica arrives, vowing to make Rick pay for upsetting her brother. The boy tells her that the 40-year-old man bullied him and Rick corrects him, saying he's still in his 30s. However, ignoring him, Angelica throws her glove at Rick, challenging him to a duel. To their surprise, Rick picks it up, thinking about how laundry isn't easy, only to realize he's accepted the duel. The scene then shifts to the arena, where Angelica declares herself a second-class royal knight, ready to punish Rick. She explains that duels in the Fim Kingdom allows the winner to set terms for their victory, and that she intends to make Rick her lifelong slave if she wins. Rick asks Renette how strong a second-class royal knight is, and she tells him they maintain peace in the kingdom, and are as strong as a rank adventurers. This freaked him out considering he's just an F-rank adventurer, fearing that he might die. However, Renette reminds him of his training, sending Rick into PTSD, causing him to vomit. Surprisingly, he's not nervous anymore, and Renette encourages him, reminding him he's part of the powerful Orichalcum Fist. Preparing to fight, Angelica warns Rick to be ready to meet his fate. She promises to hold back since he's an F-rank adventurer and enhances her body and weapons with magic. She then speeds past Rick, who is surprised by her swiftness. Watching from the stands, Freed boasts that his sister is nicknamed Lightspeed Angelica because of her incredible speed. However, Rick perceives her movements in slow motion and easily dodges, stunning Angelica as is hard to believe since even first-ranked knights struggle to react to her speed. Angelica attacks repeatedly, but Rick finds her movements slow, wondering if she used connections to become a royal knight, which led to him considering that he might be stronger than he realized. However, during one of her attacks, Angelica stumbles on a rock, tumbling towards Rick, who narrowly avoids her strikes, thinking it was a terrifying technique. Determined, Angelica decides to move even faster despite the strain it puts on her body, as she can only use this technique three times. She swiftly charges at Rick, who still finds her slow but remains cautious. But he dodges again, and Angelica, frustrated, decides to go full speed until she lands a hit. But as Angelica charges for the last time, she trips on a rock again, messing up Rick's timing. She narrowly escapes his punch, but is terrified by the destruction caused by his power. They soon demand to know who he is, and Rick explains his backstory, admitting he has to give his all against her because she's strong. This freaks Angelica out even more, leading her to surrender. Puzzled by her surrender, Rick suddenly remembers their promise before the duel. However, right after hearing this, she runs away as fast as she can to avoid this fate. This led Rick to wonder if it's alright for him to win like this. But Renette reassures him that it's fine and reminds him that the results of the first round of exams will be announced soon. Suddenly, Renette mentions that other members of Orchalcum Fist will be dropping by later, which revives his PTSD, knowing that nothing good ever comes from their visits. In the next scene, a legend is told about a warrior who once faced the supreme monster Kaiser Alsapi in a quest to conquer a treasure capable of granting any wish. The Akashic Records However, this warrior never managed to defeat the mythical creature and believed that someday, a child with dreams of becoming an adventurer would obtain the treasure. Back in the current kingdom of Philem, the results of the preliminary tests for rank E are about to be announced. If the magical energy transmitted to each exam card is blue, the candidate has passed. Tomorrow, the approved candidates will participate in a simulated battle in the second stage of the exam. Rick is tense, knowing that another failure could mean his definitive withdrawal, even his age. His card soon begins to glow, fluctuating from blue to red before finally confirming his approval. Upon leaving the room, Rick smells something awful and encounters a young nobleman charming Rionette. The nobleman introduces himself as Raster Diarmut, the eldest son of the House of Diarmut, which governs the land from north to south. He asks the maiden's name, and she responds that she is Rionette Elfelt. 
Rick also introduces himself, but Raster dismisses him as an irrelevant fool. He then continues to flirt with Rionette, stating that he has lost his heart to her, and would like to take her to the Northern Lands as his second wife. Seeing the situation deteriorating, Rick intervenes, claiming to be Rionette's boyfriend to ward off Raster's advances. Raster mocks Rick's F-rank card, but Rick retorts that Raster is also no longer a kid to be taking the rank E exam. However, Raster seizes the opportunity to boast that he passed the E-rank exam at only 14 years old and is now an A-rank adventurer, even serving as the examiner for the simulated battle. Full of himself, he shows his credentials and advises Rinek to leave Rick and dying with a real adventurer. Rinek politely declines, stating that she is with Rick and adding that Raster's cologne is so strong it's causing her discomfort. Outraged, Raster calls Rick fifth-rate trash and tells him to prepare for the simulated battle, promising to show the difference between them and knocks some sense into Rionette. After Raster leaves, Rick apologizes to Rionette for claiming she is his girlfriend, but she confesses that the story made her happy and resolved the issue. Meanwhile, back at his palace, Raster drowns his sorrows in drink, cursing Rick's life. Suddenly, his siblings arrive in tears, complaining that a 30-year-old commoner made fun of them during the first test. Infuriated, Raster vows to make the man pay, suspecting it might be Rick. Freed then remembers the man's registration number was unlucky and jokes that the guy was going to die, confirming Raster's suspicion. A few days later, the time for the simulated battle arrives. Before the test, Rina asks Rick to go easy on people, but he replies that he's not even capable of going hard, unlike the northern playboy, who will probably beat him. Feeling doomed, Rick starts to cry until a man named Lynx Laura introduces himself as Rick's examiner for the battle, responsible for attendees numbers 4200 and above. Realizing that his registration number is 4242, Rick immediately celebrates. However, Lynx praises Rick, saying that his decision to quit his job at 30 to become an adventurer has restored hope for him, as he dreams of one day being like Rick. He then recalled that he started as an adventurer at 24 and only got his career going after 30. Now 40 years old, he sees Rick as an example of determination and intends to fulfill his dream of reaching A rank, despite it taking him almost 20 years to reach B rank. Rick enthusiastically greets the man, and although Lynx emphasizes that he will not show favoritism in the exam, he invites Rick for a drink after the test. Meanwhile, Raster eavesdrops on their conversation from his hiding spot, waiting for the examiner to pass by so he can approach him. With the weight lifted off his shoulders, Rick feels much more relaxed for the battle. However, one of the organizers suddenly enters the concentration room and informs everyone that Lynx Laura, the examiner for candidates 4200 and above, has suddenly fallen ill and given the situation, Raster Diarmut will take over these candidates. Renet had already suspected there would be a problem, considering Rick had crossed paths with the three Diarmut sons. Suddenly, an adventurer laments Raster being the examiner, known as the Man of a Thousand Skills, a genius who reached A rank at just 17 years old. Worse, he has another nickname, the F-Rank Crusher, known for harassing candidates for pure entertainment. Desperate, Rick asks Rinette what to do now. Despite not understanding all the drama, Rinette reassures him that since other people's words can give or take away confidence, Rick is a strong man capable of passing the tests and defeating Raster. Ever since Rick decided to become an adventurer, all he's done is succeed. Hearing these words, Rick feels more motivated to continue his journey. Suddenly, a hooded kid approaches Rick, offering to read his fortune for free, sensing a man fighting his own demons. With nothing better to do, Rick accepts and sits in the chair, falling into a magical trap and vanishing. The kid then reveals himself to be Freed Diarmut. Enraged, Rionette cuts the kid's crystal ball in half, blowing up the wall behind him in the process and grabs Freed by the collar to find out where Rick has been sent. But when he refuses to cooperate, she cuts half of his eyelashes and warns that next time it will be his eyes. Panicked, Freed admits it's a teleportation spell that reaches 90 meters, meaning Rick isn't far. The scene then reveals that Rick ended up behind the test area, greeted by an elite guard and his cronies. Realizing he's being sabotaged by the Diarmut family, Rick discovers the strength of the men surrounding him is equivalent to B-rank, and the leader can take on A-rank warriors. Rick's fate seems sealed, but the Orchalcum fist suddenly appears on the hill. The orc seeing this reminds Rick that he has a test and asks what the hell he's doing there. However, Rick tries to lie, stating that these men around him are helping him warm up for the simulated battle. The orc then offers to help too, causing Rick to despair and tell the elite guards to run for their lives. The guards, not feeling threatened, attack the orc. One strikes the orc's head with a hammer, which crumbles without causing any damage. Unsatisfied, the man attacks the orc's arm, prompting the orc to break his wrist. To everyone's surprise, the orc heals his attacker's hand and explains the importance of balance and weight compensation for a stronger punch, 
emphasizing that the body is a completely connected mass that can't be ignored. Hearing these words, the elite guard's leader realizes who these people are. Meanwhile, the Orchalcum Fist Boy pulls out his magical weapon, Juliet, loaded with magic stones and lead bullets. He then attacks three enemies in front of him, leaving Rick stunned. However, the guards take the Orchalcum girl hostage and order everyone to surrender, threatening to harm her. Rick and the Orc warn the man to let her go before something worse happens, and the girl asks her friends what the guy behind her is doing. He then explains to Alice that the man is just trying to play, so she asks what kind of game it is. Losing patience, the guard punches her to keep her quiet, awakening the child's fury. She soon destroys everything around her with seventh nature composite magic. The guard's leader bows his head and explains that this girl, only 10 years old, is the most powerful vampire mage, known as the demon child of devastation, Alice Drackle. As for the other member, who looks like a boy, he's actually a half-elf, half-dwarf, over 50 years old with techniques a millennium ahead of his time. He is the greatest weaponsmith in the world, Mezit Elborf, known as the Millennial Workshop. Lastly, the orc possessing unparalleled physical strength and intelligence able to use all existing support spells is called Broston Ashork, the Wise Beast. According to the guard leader, the three Arank adventurers make up the continent's most legendary group, the Orchalcum Fist. For the first time in his life, the old man sees these three with his own eyes, drops his weapons, and declares he will retire to live the rest of his life in peace. With that said, Alice annihilates the remaining guards while Rick celebrates his chance to take the test. Back with Renette, the adventurer surprises Freed, who thought the old man was as good as dead. The elf gets rid of him ruthlessly. Then Lynx appears, injured, and reports that Raster did this to him. As if that weren't enough before giving the examiner a beating, the hare asked what his dream was. Coming from humble beginnings, Link's dream is to open a school for kids who want to be adventurers but have no opportunities. Hearing this, Raster locked Lynx up and scorned his attempt to educate society's scum, saying a third-rate teacher will produce students just as rotten. Lynx was furious at this insult but couldn't respond to the noble. Thinking about this, the examiner asks Rick to give up the exam, not knowing what he's getting into. But Rick has no intention of giving up. Returning to the arena, Raster sees one of his guards fall unconscious and deduces that Rick is on his way. The noble would love to crush that man's dreams without even allowing him to try. But since he'll have the displeasure of a direct clash, he wonders if he can make f -rank suffer in another way, making hell seem like a playground for Rick. While Raster tormented the poor trainees in the yard, one of the men on the benches above watched and laughed at the scene. This man had a unique ability to observe someone's stats and determine their abilities. There are four major abilities in this world, physical strength, magical strength, speed, and dexterity. Enjoying the show, he checked each participant facing Raster, predicting how badly they would be defeated. Another training of the average stats faced Raster and was immediately decimated by Raster's lightning magic, causing Adolf to laugh hysterically. Out of curiosity, Adolf checked Raster's stats, confirming that Raster had an incredible amount of magic befitting in a ranker. However, looking at Raster's stats for too long made Adolf's eyes hurt due to their intensity. He then noticed that another person was ready to face Raster and dismissed him as insignificant due to his age. However, Adolf decided to check Rick's stats and was shocked to find that Rick had max stats in all categories except magic. The sight of his stats caused intense pain in Adolf's eyes, making him roll on the floor in pain. Meanwhile, Renette found Alicia, who had come to watch Rick's final exam, and invited her to sit with the rest of her party. Alicia was initially scared to see an orc and a demon vampire, but was quickly reassured by Renette. The orc then asked Renette about Rick's chances, and without hesitation, she replied that Rick would easily pass the exam. Upon hearing this, Alicia was doubtful, pointing out Raster's superior magic and how he overwhelmed the weak trainees. Initially, the orc looked concerned but relaxed upon learning Raster was an A-ranking adventurer, confident that Rick could handle it. On the battlefield, Raster commended Rick for getting past his guards but warned him not to think too highly of himself as the guards were commoners while he was an A-ranking prodigy. Rick then asked why Raster became an adventurer, to which the cocky brat replied that he was a genius who wanted to add an A-ranking adventurer title to his resume to bring more prestige to his noble family. However, Raster admitted he didn't respect adventurers and saw them as peasants. The battle soon began with Raster shooting an ice blast toward Rick, which missed as Rick stood still. He continues to laugh, wanting to toy with Rick to scare him. Meanwhile, Rick tried to remain calm, remembering Renette's advice to observe his opponent. Believing Rick was too scared to act, Raster decided to finish the battle quickly. He used his extremely strong flame magic, blasting Rick with it. But to everyone's surprise, Rick emerged unscathed. Alicia was shocked, but the orc explained that a tiny attack like that couldn't harm Rick's body. He explained that among the four core attributes, magic could only be trained until the age of 20. 
Since Rick started training at 30, his mana pool couldn't increase. Therefore, the orc focused on enhancing Rick's physical toughness, starting his training by making Rick wear 100 kilograms ankle weights, which was equivalent to your mother's weight, and forced him to run through a forest filled with demonic snakes. Back on the battlefield, Raster decided to unleash an even stronger spell from his arsenal and blasted Rick with wind magic, sending waves of stormy winds at him. Yet again, Rick stood his ground, unmoved. Angered, Raster used a lightning spell, but Rick persevered through it effortlessly. Confused by Rick's resilience, Alicia asked Renette for an explanation. She then revealed that Rick was as strong as an S-ranked adventurer, but the catch was that he didn't know it himself. All this time, the orc trainer had deceived Rick, telling him that even an F-ranked adventurer could outperform him, while Rick was actually cracking boulders with his punches. Inside the arena, Raster lost his composure and went all out, unleashing a barrage of magic at Rick simultaneously. Convinced that Rick would be dead this time, Raster watched in disbelief as the dust cleared to reveal Rick breaking a giant boulder in half. Shocked by Rick's sturdiness, Raster decided to take matters into his own hands. Reinforcing his body with magic to make his fists harder than steel, he rushed at Rick with extreme speed. However, Rick remained unfazed, throwing a lazy punch that connected with Raster's, sending him flying. But Raster soon regained his balance and landed on his feet, bewildered at how Rick resisted his attacks. Having observed enough, Rick concluded that Raster's incredible mana pool was poorly utilized due to his lack of rigorous training. Every move Raster made was unpolished and inefficient, giving Rick confidence that he couldn't lose to this noble brat. Raster, now serious, unleashed his strongest fire magic, but even this was effortlessly blocked by Rick, who stopped the attack with his hand. He then attempted to do a sneak attack, rushing at Rick, but was counterpunched immediately. However, Raster managed to change his body to steel just in time, barely avoiding meeting my uncle in heaven. Covered in dust, Raster still refused to acknowledge Rick's skills, calling it coincidence. This enraged Rick, who recalled his intense training where he survived in a dragon's nest, ran through explosions, and drowned in a venomous pond. He then remembered the elf pushing him off a cliff, Alice crushing him beneath a rock, and being hit by falling logs while training with Rinette. However, thanks to the orc's special healing magic, Rick was successfully revived and pushed past his human limits. Back at the present, Raster used earth magic to bind Rick with strong roots. He then began chanting a long spell that created a tree golem, telling Rick to say his prayers. But Rick, confident in his level 1 airshot magic that he had practiced millions of times, broke through bondage. As Raster descended to finish Rick with a magical punch, Rick countered with his own punch, which sent a huge shockwave through the arena. Initially confident, Raster was shocked as Rick's airshot overpowered his magic, shattering the tree golem into pieces and blasting Raster into the benches, leaving him unconscious. Upon witnessing Raster's defeat, the crowd was stunned that the strongest examiner was defeated by an unknown old man. The scene then shifts to Rick reuniting with his friends, who congratulated him on passing the test. But before they could celebrate with lunch, Raster, accompanied by his siblings, approached Rick. He then promised to be the examiner for Rick's promotion exam and vowed to defeat him next time. That evening, as the results for the passing adventurers were unveiled, Rick and Rianette eagerly awaited his name, wondering about the adventures that lay ahead. Back at the room, Rianette noticed that Rick seemed much less nervous than when he was waiting for the preliminary stage results. However, he soon confesses that he was remembering key life events. Flashbacks then showed a young Rick, inspired by the legend of Yamato, informing his mom and dad about his dream of becoming an adventurer. However, his mother pointed out the dangers of adventuring, expressing her wish for him to pursue a safer path. His father also dismissed the legend of Yamato as mere fantasy and urged Rick to aim for a stable job, which crushed young Rick's heart. Despite his parents' discouragement, Rick received good news from a doctor who confirmed he had a rare inborn skill marker, similar to Yamato from the legends. The doctor reminded him that the skill couldn't be triggered through training. Excited, Rick hoped to manifest his skill to prove his parents wrong. He then shared his secret with friends and eagerly awaited its manifestation, but a year passed with no sign. Rick, now a teenager, still showed no sign of his skill. Friends soon advised him to become an adventurer while waiting for the skill to manifest, noting the potential of the profession. As he grew older, Rick settled for a job as a receptionist at the Tiger Road Guild. This time, his parents were proud of this respectable and stable position. Rick worked hard befriending an adventurer named Zed and eventually welcoming Elisa to the team. But despite continuing efforts to manifest his hidden abilities, Rick finally shelved his childhood book about Yamato. One day, he helped Elisa handle a customer and discuss the increasing monster sightings, predicting a D-rank quest to deal with the issue. Not long after, Zed informed Rick of his promotion to B-rank, 
allowing him to become a full-time adventurer. While happy for his friend, Rick felt a sense of regret for not chasing his dreams. After work, a gut-wrenching cry for help caught his attention. Rushing to the scene, he encountered a giant troll, a mid-level monster, and jumped in front of a young Renette to protect her. However, Renette swiftly defeated the creature and thanked Rick for his bravery, assuring him that she, as an adventurer, could handle herself. This incident served as an icebreaker between them, and as they walked through town, Rick felt a mix of embarrassment and shock, especially when Renette revealed she was an S-rank adventurer. Noting that S-rankers are the pinnacle of the adventuring pyramid, Rick seized the opportunity to ask if it was possible for him to become an adventurer at his age expressing his dream of defeating Kaiser Alcipiet. Initially, Renette acknowledged his courage but bluntly told him it was almost impossible because he wouldn't meet the minimum magical reserves necessary for the job. Soon after hearing this, Rick tried to hide the fact that his soul had just been crushed through laughter and joking around. He rambled on and somehow ended up asking Renette on a date, to which she agreed. The next morning, Rick went to work so happy that everyone was a little creeped out. He finished his shift and went to meet up with his date, but it was ruined before it even started because of another monster attack. He rushed to the direction of the commotion and found Renette standing in a sea of monster corpses. She demanded that Rick step to the side while she dealt with the waves of creatures that kept coming. However, she suddenly froze in fear as visions of a burning town flashed in his mind. Luckily, Zed and the others came in clutch to defeat the remaining monsters. Renette soon warned him that the area was dangerous because there was a dragon close by, explaining that her body had a traumatic reaction, causing her to lose control of her magic every time she felt a dragon's energy. However, Rick doubted a dragon would appear in such a residential area, but he shut up when the creature flew over them. This caused one of the adventurers to panic and fired a spell at it, only aggravating the monster even more, causing it to let out a roar that blew them all down. Zed soon gave the order for everyone to run since they couldn't fight such a monster. But they were unable to escape because the dragon put up a barrier. However, everyone was surprised to see Rick turning to face the high-ranked creature. But Rick told everyone that if he was going to lose his life, he might as well stand up to it in hopes of meeting his demise as an adventurer. Deep inside, Rick was terrified because the sinister presence of the dragon was overwhelming him. But facing such a foe got his blood boiling because he always wanted to live this lifestyle. He then picked up a rock and threw it at the creature, but it didn't do anything to the big green frog. However, Zed was inspired by Rick's resilience. He then turned to the other adventurers, asking if they were going to let receptionist lead the charge. They soon dashed in and attacked, but it did little to no damage, as this was one of those moments where effort didn't count. The dragon then shot its fire breath, but Zed protected everyone with his iron body spell. Rick suddenly busted out of the rubble and stepped forward, determined to make his dream come true. But the dragon just stomped on him, shocking everyone. However, Renette noticed something. The scene then shows a voice informing Rick that he had acquired a skill. Turns out, Rick's powers finally activated at the most clutch moment. He then pushed the dragon's claws up as he stood strong before punching it away. While everyone is in disbelief, Renette noted that he was overflowing with so much magic power that it had become visible. Stunned by his own powers, he now saw the dragon as an oversized lizard and blocked its most powerful fire shot before countering it with a punch that blew the monster's head off. As everyone is in pure disbelief, Rick collapsed, commenting on how decent his skill was. A few days later, he finally woke up to find Renette at his bedside. There, she informed him that he had been out for the past week. Renette then revealed that she had stayed by his side so that she could invite him to join the Orichalcum Fist. She continued by explaining that it was their party's objective to defeat Kaiser Alcipiet. Upon hearing that the legend was real, and that he could become an adventurer, Rick cried his feelings out. The flashback then ended with Rick finding out that he had passed the exam. With the scene shifting to Rick telling his younger self that he had finally become an adventurer. The scene then shifts to Lynx congratulating Rick on passing and reminding him about the celebratory drink they had planned. Initially, Rick thinks it's a great idea, but he's surprised when Lynx expresses interest in meeting his party and asks to visit them. However, Rick's hesitation is evident, but he eventually agrees to let Lynx meet them. Later, as Lynx heads out to visit, he finds it odd that Rick told him to bring his most powerful gear. Upon arrival, Lynx doubts he's at the correct location because it resembles the Demon Lord's castle. After ringing the bell, Rick greets him and Lynx notices the absence of monsters along the way. Rick explains that monsters don't approach the place, which makes Lynx question why he needed his armor if not for monsters. But he explains that the armor is to prevent him from ending up in a casket. Lynx is then introduced to the girls of the group. Upon seeing her, he hopes his daughter will grow up happy like Alice, but is shocked when Alice casts a level 6 spell just by saying, boom. Rick quickly saves Lynx from being obliterated and scolds Alice for using magic inside. 
However, Lynx is stunned to learn that Alice only wanted to play and Rionette mentions that she'll deduct the repair costs from Alice's food budget. Instantly, she pleads for forgiveness, so Rick decides to spend some time with her to help her calm down. Lynx then relaxes and admires the size of the place. He soon meets Mizzet outside, who explains that creating crazy weapons is a hobby. Lynx then tries Mizzet's latest weapon, and Mizzet instructs him to infuse it with magic while pulling the trigger. However, the recoil sends Lynx flying backwards, and the shot causes significant damage. The recoil is too much, so Mizzet decides to make some adjustments. Amazed, Lynx realized that if the weapon were mass-produced, it would change warfare forever. Lynx begins to see how extraordinary this place is and also meets Broston, surrounded by books. There he wonders if this intellectual orc is part of the party, but Broston says he's read most of the books in his library. He then mentioned that he hasn't had much time to read lately because he's been training Rick. So Broston offers Lynx a training session, which Lynx eagerly accepts. Suddenly, Broston also notices the determination in Lynx's eyes, which is reminiscent of Rick. Later, Rick is shocked to learn that Lynx went with Broston into the forest because he knows the dangers there. He soon hears Lynx screaming in fear, thinking he's about to die as he flies off a mountain, bidding farewell to his wife and kids. Fortunately, he lands safely on the food Renette gathered for dinner. She then notices the weights attached to Lynx and suspects Broston's involvement. Lynx confirms it, explaining that Broston instructed him to run down a slope so steep it was nearly a cliff. However, Lynx is certain he wouldn't be alive without Rionette's intervention, and she explains that Broston challenged Rick the most during his training. This revelation scared him so much that he pretended not to hear it, and Broston arrived to continue the training. Afterwards, Lynx is relieved to have survived and tells Rick that Broston was supposed to give him light training. But Rick warns Lynx not to trust any of them when they mention easy training. Broston then points out that he can revive people if the training proves fatal. As the guys wait for dinner, Lynx wonders about Rick's closeness to Renette. So Rick clarifies that their relationship isn't romantic, partly because of his age. However, Lynx surprises him by revealing that he and his wife have a 20-year age difference. So he encourages Rick once again, saying that what matters most is how they feel about each other. That night, everyone enjoys the feast Renette prepared and compliments her, and when Renette goes to get some wine, Lynx suggests to Rick that this is the perfect opportunity to assist her and grow closer. He then hurries to assist Renette while Lynx inquires about Rick's innate skill. There, Broston explains that Rick's skill is one that activates under specific conditions, meaning Rick can't trigger it at will. However, thanks to his training, Rick is now at an S-rank level, even without relying on his skill or weapons. Rick's skill, called Reckless Soul, would make him surpass everyone, even other members of Orchalcum Fist, if activated. Broston then asks Lynx about the magic stones known as the Six Jewels linked to the Legends of Yamato. Rick reveals that their goal is to defeat Kaiser Alsapiet and the Six Jewels are magic stones that open the gateway to where Kaiser Alsapiet sleeps, activating every 200 years and currently emitting vast amounts of magic as they reach this part of their cycle. Lynx, who always questioned the stories, feels more confident hearing them discuss it, but admits he has no current information on the stones. He then promises to check the confidential department for more details. Just then, Rick asks Lynx for further advice, mentioning that he tried to assist Renette as Lynx suggested, but she is proficient at everything and didn't mean much help. The next day, a new adventurer wonders why she has to clean the guild when she could be defeating monsters. She notices Broston attempting to take on a particular job but being denied. But Broston is puzzled because the job's danger level is only 82, which they can handle easily. However, the young adventurer, Ree, finds the group peculiar and is surprised by the guild master's respectful demeanor toward them. Rick, using his receptionist skills, determines they can take the job if they have two A ranks in a four-person party. So Broson asks for help finding a fourth member, and the guild master suggests Ree. Though hesitant to join the unusual party, the guild master assures her they are exceptional adventurers. Despite seeing a talking orc, a little girl, and an older man, Ree, eager for adventure, decides to lend her strength. During the quest, the group searches for a magic stone, which Lynx indicated should be nearby. Rhea wonders about its value, but while the stone is valuable, it requires careful handling and attracts monsters. Undeterred, Rhea is confident in her ability to handle any monster, though she is currently only an F rank, aspiring to become an A rank soon. Rick then reveals he just reached E rank, confirming Rhea's suspicion of him as a late starting adventurer. Meanwhile, Renette hopes the others are okay, and Mizzet assures her Broston is with them. Mizzet then attempts to use his gadgets to peek at Renette's jacked, but she destroys his machine in mere seconds. Back with Rick, Broston determines they're nearing the lair they're seeking. 
Rhi is terrified upon seeing a wyvern and shocked that they're approaching a wyvern lair and warns Broston not to approach the beast without a plan, but Broston remains unfazed, sending the wyvern flying across the forest. Rhi fears his actions might attract more wyverns. That's exactly what Broston intends. Broston soon tells Rick to escort Rhi to safety to avoid her being turned to ash, horrifying her at the danger level. He then reminds Rhi of her supposed strength as a wyvern lands beside them. They soon watch as Alice and Broston quickly dispatch a flock of wyverns, astounding Ray with their prowess. Suddenly, a giant red wyvern appears and Rhea believes even an A-rank adventurer would struggle and suggest they run. Rick initially agrees but wants to check something, refusing to retreat despite the odds. Inspired by Rick's resolve, Rhea decides to fight alongside him. As Rai prepares a protective spell, she's stunned when Rick one-shots the beast, proving his strength. The next day, Rhea is exhausted and the guild master comments that nothing good ever happens when Orichalcum Fist is involved. Flashing back to the previous day, Rhea asks what they'll do with the wyvern corpse, surprised to learn Rhianette plans to cook it for dinner. She can't fathom eating a wyvern, but the guild master explains that Orichalcum Fist members are considered the strongest on the continent. He hopes her experience with them taught her caution, but it actually motivates her to train harder. The scene then shifts back to the group successfully obtaining one of the six jewels, the Crimson Blossom, which contains immense magic and should help locate the other jewels. Alice wants to activate it, but everyone decides against it, fearing she'd destroy it like everything else. Mizzet then activates the jewel, revealing a map of Heractopia, a city where combat thrives and is known for its Colosseum. We then catch a glimpse of a fight in the Colosseum, with a girl emerging victorious. Rick, Brosten, and Rionette soon arrive at the Kingdom of Heratopia. Broston shares the tale of the first King Alexander, who established a small arena back when the kingdom was still a fledgling nation. Alexander himself participated in the arena battles, fighting with his bare fists and soon became a champion with an undefeated streak of over 10,000 victories. As word spread, fighters from across the globe came to challenge him, and an even larger crowd gathered to witness the invincible king. This influx of people quickly transformed Herotopia into a vast and prosperous kingdom, a place where martial arts thrive to this day. Broston is eager to gauge the skill level of Herotopia's warriors but stays focused on their mission to gather information about the six grand orbs. However, every person they approach seems to be intimidated by Broston. Suddenly, they notice a cat girl being harassed by a bald thug on the street. Rick steps forward to help, but Broston takes charge and confronts the thug, telling him to back off. The thug, undeterred, claims to be a martial artist and warns Broston to mind his own business. Broston dismisses the thug, saying he doesn't look strong, which enrages the thug. He challenges Broston to a fight in a secluded corner and Broston agrees, following him, only to emerge moments later with the thug, now completely subdued and obedient. The thug introduces himself as Gold, and the girl he was harassing reveals her name is Millie. Broston shows them the red orb and asks if they've seen anything like it. Both Gold and Millie say they have seen a similar orb but can't recall its exact location. As they talk, a parade passes by on the main road. Millie excitedly explains that it's the parade for the announcement of the Fist King Tournament, the kingdom's biggest event. The parade's highlight is Kelvin, the reigning champion, who has remained undefeated for the past three years. Rick is impressed by Kelvin's popularity and even Broston acknowledges his talent as a fighter. Suddenly, Gold and Millie become nervous and reveal that the orb they're searching for is embedded in Kelvin's champion belt. Meanwhile, Kelvin heads to the gym where he meets the owner who asks if Kelvin's body is in good shape to which Kelvin replies that he would feel better if a strong opponent joined the tournament this time. Just then, Rick and Renette enter the gym. Kelvin immediately senses that Rick is the formidable opponent he's been hoping for. But the gym owner, mistaking Rick for a mere fan, tries to send him away. Rick attempts to explain that they're adventurers searching for a certain jewel, but Broston interrupts, heading straight for Kelvin to address the issue directly. Rick suggests following proper protocol, but Broston insists they don't have time for that. Kelvin is surprised to see a talking orc and asks what he wants. Broston straightforwardly demands the champion's belt, which infuriates the gym owner, who threatens to call security. Kelvin, however, stops him, claiming he can sense lies and believes Broston is telling the truth. Still, Kelvin declares that the belt is a symbol of Herotopia's pride, and the only way to claim it is by winning the Fist King tournament. Broston agrees and leaves, stating that he will win the belt the right way. After the visitors leave, the gym owner asks Kelvin why he didn't teach them a lesson. Kelvin explains that if he had, everyone in the gym would be dead. The gym owner is shocked by this revelation, and Kelvin elaborates that he could tell Rinette possessed great skill. Rick had trained his body to an extreme level, and Broston was undoubtedly the strongest of them all. Later, Broston tells Rick they must compete in the tournament to win the belt. 
To qualify for the main event, they need to win the regional tournaments in both the East and the West. Browson instructs Rick to head west with Rionette while he goes east. Rick is concerned about Browson being alone in a foreign country, but Browson assures him he has a guide. Just then, Gold arrives with an extravagant carriage. Rick proceeds to take the test to enter the Western League. There, the examiner explains that his opponent will be selected at random, and that you will be judged on skill, not the outcome of the fight. Rick is startled when he recognizes his opponent's voice before even turning around. Turns out, it's Angelica, the Nike fought during the adventurer exam. Angelica, full of confidence, is taken aback when she sees Rick, but both of them are surprised to encounter each other in the arena. As the fight begins, Angelica, determined to win quickly, gets into her stance. However, before she can even make a move, something trips her, causing her to fall. Frustrated, she assumes she stumbled due to excitement, but when she tries again, the same thing happens. She becomes angry, thinking Rick is underestimating her, but then realizes that his technique is so fast she can't even see it. Desperately, she tries to keep her distance, but Rick continues to trip her, repeatedly knocking her down. Seeing that Angelica doesn't lose her will to fight, Rick praises her, acknowledging that she's a worthy opponent for him to go all out against. However, before he can make a move, Angelica surrenders. With that, Rick is granted permission to enter the Western qualifiers. As he and Rionette are leaving later that evening, Angelica confronts him in tears, asking how long he plans to keep humiliating her. Taken aback by her outburst, Rick decides to cheer her up by treating her to dinner. They head to an inn run by the cat girl Millie's parents. There, Millie serves them, but she keeps glancing around, clearly looking for Broston, who is left for the Eastern qualifiers. During dinner, Angelica asks Rick why he's there, and he replies that he intends to win the Fist King tournament. When she asks if he means this year or the next, Rick confirms he's talking about the upcoming tournament. Angelica warns him that it's impossible, no matter how strong he is. Confused, Rick and Rionette realize they may have underestimated the challenge. So Angelica explains that a fighter must win 40 matches to qualify, which usually takes around 6 months. The next day, Rick heads to the qualifiers, where the receptionist cautions him about his opponent, who allegedly uses weapons despite them being banned. The staff couldn't find any on him, but Rick remains wary. As the fight begins, the opponent, a notorious crook who delights in crushing newcomers, pulls out a magic gem called the Impact Stone, which amplifies the force of his punches. He throws his coat at Rick's face to blind him, then lands a punch with the Impact Stone. However, Rick emerges unscathed, while the crook's hand is injured. The Impact Stone falls, and Rick advises the crook to train his body more if he plans to use such a tool. Rick then knocks out his opponent with a shockwave from a deliberately missed punch, winning his first fight and preparing for the remaining 39. In the next match, Angelica faces a karate boy. As the match starts, the boy leaps into the air, aiming to land an axe kick on Angelica. But she effortlessly dodges using her blink step and counters with a powerful back kick, sending her opponent flying into a wall and securing her victory. Outside the arena, Rick congratulates her on winning all 40 of her matches, which qualifies her for the main tournament. Angelica, surprised, asks if Rick truly plans to fight 40 opponents in four days, noting that it's nearly impossible. Rick nonchalantly responds, asking what's so hard about that. Angelica realizes he hasn't done any research and explains that a fighter can only have one match per day in a single arena, and to fight 10 matches, he'd need to visit 10 different arenas, each hundreds of kilometers apart. Rick remains unfazed, pointing out that his next arena is only 30 kilometers away and that his match is in 10 minutes. Angelica, shocked, says he can't possibly make it in time, even by carriage. Rick looks at her incredulously, exclaiming that he wouldn't use a carriage when he's in a rush, and then takes off at incredible speed, leaving even Angelica, known for her lightning fast moves and all. Rina asks if Angelica wants to see the match, and she absentmindedly nods, claiming it's impossible to catch up. But Rina grabs her and starts leaping across rooftops toward the next arena. By the time they arrive, the match is already over, with Rick having easily defeated his opponent. Angelica is left trembling from the ride, but Rick doesn't have time to talk and rushes off to the next spot, with Rina carrying Angelica again. Rick continues to win his matches with ease, using techniques like running circles around his opponents until they knock themselves out. Four days pass, and Angelica is utterly shocked that Rick actually managed to win 40 matches in such a short time. She's relieved that they aren't in the same tournament block or she'd stand no chance. Rina comments that Rick isn't even the strongest fighter in the tournament, mentioning Browson, the S-ranked adventurer who trained Rick to this level. Realizing she's up against literal monsters, Angelica asks where Rick went today. Rina casually replies that Rick is on a quick 600 kilometers jog to a nearby city, a fact that no longer surprises her as she sips her tea. Later that evening, Rick returns from his jog only to be stopped by a slithery lizard man named Snape. 
Snape, introducing himself as the chairman of the West League Committee, congratulates Rick on setting a new record by defeating so many opponents in just four days. As they shake hands, Rick instantly recognizes that Snape is a warrior. Snape mentions that he used to fight years ago and even won a small tournament when he was 23 before retiring. Now a merchant, he's also an old friend of Angelica's family. After telling Rick to take care and to pass his greetings to Angelica, Snape leaves in his carriage. Rick, still puzzled by the encounter, enters Millie's restaurant where she expresses concern. She warns Rick that although Snape seems like a gentleman, there are rumors that he's involved with the underworld and has shady connections with gangsters. Rick wonders why Snape would seek him out when he overhears some men talking about a new dark elf bunny girl who's stealing everyone's hearts. Realizing they must be talking about Rionette, Rick rushes to the stadium only to find Rionette and Angelica dressed in bunny girl costumes encouraging kids to gamble. But suddenly a rowdy customer becomes louder and more obnoxious as he starts mocking Angelica. Not in the mood to tolerate any nonsense, she swiftly beats the crap out of him, stepping on his head and daring anyone else to try their luck. Meanwhile, back at the gym, the discount Nick Fury reads a newspaper reporting that Broston won 40 matches in just two days, each with a single punch. He wonders what kind of beast they're dealing with while Kelvin talks about Rick's feat of winning 40 bouts in four days, which also impresses him. Kelvin is excited, reminding Nick Fury of the day he first met him in a rough town, where Kelvin used to dominate gang wars. Nick Fury had found him beating up an entire group of people and offered him a chance at a better life, bringing him to Heratopia to fight in the gladiator arenas and earn an honest living. The next morning, Renette, Angelica, and Rick sit down for breakfast. Rick mentions the encounter with Snape, who claimed to know Angelica. However, Angelica seems stressed at the mention of his name and denies knowing anyone by that name. Later that day, the first main match of the tournament begins with Angelica facing off against another adventurer. Renette notices that Angelica seems unusually tense as she launches an attack. Angelica's opponent, a brutish woman, blocks her kick and tries to counter, but Angelica is quicker, landing a powerful kick that sends her opponent into the wall, winning her first match. Rick's match follows where he faces a random fighter who tries to use wind magic against him. Rick effortlessly dodges the attacks and delivers a karat chop that barely grazes his opponent but is powerful enough to knock him out cold. The subsequent matches go by quickly, with both Angelica and Rick easily defeating their opponents. By evening, Angelica is exhausted from all the fights. Rick tries to warn her about her final opponent for the day, but she brushes him off and enters the arena. Her final opponent is a massive, ugly brute whose appearance alone could knock someone out. Angelica remains determined, using her blink step to close the distance and surrounding him with a wall of water before launching an electric blast. However, the brute's thick skin allows him to withstand the attack. As Angelica rushes in to continue her assault, the brute dodges her strikes and lands a massive punch, sending her crashing into the wall and knocking her out. Later that night, Angelica is treated by a nurse who advises her to take it easy. As she leaves the infirmary, Rick confronts her, asking why she fought so recklessly against an opponent with such strong defenses. Angelica acts strangely and tells him to mind his own business before walking off. Rick follows her, finally wearing her down until she confesses the truth. Snape is her fiancé. After her parents died, her grandfather made a deal with Snape, selling Angelica to him in exchange for a large sum of money. Now the engagement is set and breaking it would bring shame to her noble family. Angelica reveals that Snape is a major sponsor of the tournament and has entered his own fighter, which is why she's been trying to uncover his shady dealings. She suspects that Snape is involved in match-fixing and is trying to make a fortune through his chosen fighter. Angelica joined the tournament in hopes of defeating Snape's fighter and exposing his scandal, but now she feels it may be impossible. Suddenly, they hear commotion coming from a nearby tavern. Peeking inside, they see a red lizard man choking a waitress. The brood who defeated Angelica tries to intervene, but the lizard man easily slams him to the ground, knocking him out with a single hit. Despite her fear, Angelica shows her courage and steps in to stop the lizard man, who prepares to punch her. But before he can land the blow, Rick casually grabs his arm, telling him to back off. At that moment, Snape arrives at the tavern and orders the lizard man, Geese, who is revealed to be his younger brother, to save his strength for the tournament. Snape explains that Geese has anger issues but cools down quickly. He promises to compensate the tavern owner for the damage and leaves. Angelica tells Rick that she believes Snape is involved in match-fixing and is using his fighter to make a lot of money. She admits that she entered the tournament to defeat Snape's fighter and expose the scandal, but now she feels it might be impossible. To her surprise, Rick offers to train her for the upcoming matches. The next day, the duo wastes no time getting to work, but the task proves to be far more challenging than the girl initially imagined. 
Rick straps weights onto Angelica's body, each weighing 60 pounds, and warns her to never deactivate her body strengthening ability if she wants to stay alive. Demanding an explanation for this madness, Angelica is ignored as Rick takes off running, a rope tying them together. He explains that by pulling her along, he's forcing her to run faster and stronger. In the midst of the exercise, he corrects her flawed movements, teaching her that while she has speed, her stride lacks stability. With her hair a mess, Angelica pleads with Rick to stop, but he jokes that's the first time she's called him by name. Too exhausted to respond, she begs him to halt, but he insists that it's essential to push beyond the perceived limits, reassuring her that only six hours remain of today's training. Hours later, she collapses face first into the ground, utterly spent. Rick comments that this is the toughness required to train for his second-class night, while Angelica thanks her lucky stars that she still has her legs. Rick reminisces about his own training with Rianette, recalling how he nearly lost consciousness and died three times on the first day. Hearing this, Angelica proudly declares that she survived her first day without dying, but Rick laughs, reminding her that it's only lunchtime. By the fifth day of training, Angelica is enjoying her lunch on a warm, sunny afternoon, convinced she can't keep up this pace until the end. At least she's in a secluded spot where no one, not even Rick, can bother her. Just as she thinks this, Rick appears at the window, having searched the entire kingdom for her. Frustrated, Angelica complains that it's been less than 15 minutes since she tried to hide. To her surprise, Rick explains that he understands her desire to flee. He himself ran away dozens of times during his two years of grueling training, dying thousands of times in the process. In one memory, Browson finds Rick dead and borrows some mana from Alice to revive him. Faced with a confused Rick after yet another death, the orc explains that the vampire mage has granted the power to revive him up to 2,000 more times, so it's time to keep going at the same pace. With this memory in mind, Rick tells Angelica he's gotten used to dying. Surprised he endured it for two years, Angelica listens as Rick confesses that he tried to give up many times, but Browson always said the right thing to keep him going, urging him to weigh his current suffering against the regret of giving up. Those words made everything easier to bear. Hearing this, Angelica confesses that she hates the customs of nobility, the pristine outfits, the manners, the heavy makeup, and the ridiculous dances. Despite learning all kinds of etiquette, she loved every part of it. That's why she decided to contribute to the House of Diamond as a fighter. Her dream is to become the first special class knight, so she believes her scales also tip toward current suffering. With renewed motivation, the famous Flash is reminded by Rick that her fighting style is a modified version of the knight's sword technique, making her more powerful with a sword in hand. Since the tournament rules require fighting without weapons, Rick suggests she learn a technique to turn her hand into a blade. For that, he brings in a special instructor, Renette. After intense night training, the tournament is in full swing, leading to the final match between the C-Block leaders, each with seven wins and one loss. Only the winner will advance to the next round. In the arena, Angelica faces her opponent, trembling with fury like a caged beast. The duo of elders observing the duels comment on Diarmut's disadvantage against Silver. However, as soon as the announcer signals the start, Diarmut delivers such a powerful punch that her opponent flies against the wall with indescribable force, ending the fight to the shock of everyone present. From the stands, Rianette notices that the training has paid off, though Rick thinks Angelica might have been a little unhinged by everything she's been through. At the Militia Tavern after the victory, Angelica reflects on how the townspeople stares hurt her, making her question if she did something wrong in the tournament. Rick responds that winning is what matters, while Rianette warns that people might be afraid of her. Alice and Mizzet arrive at the tavern, and the elf asks the dwarf about the rumors that one of the six jewels is in the Empire. Mizer replies that there isn't a shred of truth to them. With the table set for a feast, the wise beast announces that all that's left now is to win the tournament and receive one of the six gems. Alice would love to participate, but Rick shuts down the mage's enthusiasm, fearing she might devastate the entire arena. Browson asks who the human at the table is, so Angelica explains that she was trained by Rick and Rianette, though many times she felt more tortured than taught. Even so, each member of the Orchalcum Fist assures her that her efforts will be rewarded, the King of Fists tournament finally begins, with the pairs announced after a random draw. With the pairs for the first round established, Angelica confides in Rick about the Dragonaut Company's scheme to rig the tournament. They manipulated the bracket to ensure that Geese wouldn't face Kelvin or Browston until the final, aiming to impress the audience with their competitors' strength from the start. When the tournament reaches its final stages and the odds are at their peak, Snape plans to place a clever bet. If Geese deliberately loses at that point, the boss will rake in a fortune. That's why they gave Geese the easiest path, including a match against Angelica in the second round, assuming he gets past the first. Angelica's plan is to sabotage their scheme by defeating Geese in their match. 
Rick asks what Angelica will do if she doesn't face Geese until the final, but she hasn't even considered that. After the bracket is set, Kelvin and his master meet with Rick and Broston. The members of the Orichalcum Fist confidently declare that they will take home the belt and the gem thereafter. Unfazed, Wolf's master recalls when Kelvin was younger. Back then, his academy only managed to get one competitor to fourth place in the tournament. Determined to do better, he pitted his new fighter against a boxer named Garen. On that occasion, Kelvin took a beating, but the taste of defeat drove him to train relentlessly until he reached his physical peak. He made his name in Heratopia by winning three tournaments, and now, six years later, the boxer faces the greatest challenge of his life. Soon in the first round begins with Geese facing Hermann Mueller. The human lands several hits on the monster who barely feels them due to his above-average resistance. After Hermann misses a strike, Geese hears a taunt from his opponent. However, as soon as Hermann attacks again, the giant lizard lands a blow to his face, taking him out in one shot. Rick finds this suspicious, although Geese is strong, his movements are amateurish. Regardless, Angelica reminds him that the fight's purpose of impressing the betters has been achieved. Next, she enters the arena and swiftly defeats Silver Helen, while Rick and Browston also advance without breaking a sweat. Now it's time for the final match of the first round. Any grace against the current champion, Kelvin Wolf. The Orichalcum Fist watches the fight closely, wanting to understand the extent of Kelvin's strength, which he demonstrates right from the first blow. Rick notes that Wolf anticipated his opponent's move, and Broston adds that the excellent sense of smell possessed by a dogman gives him an ability known as Future Scent. Despite their praise, Kelvin takes a hard hit during the fight, which Rianette claims was intentional. After taking the hit, Kelvin gets up and knocks out his rival, much to the audience's relief after seeing their favorite fighter in trouble. To Rick's surprise, he overhears one of the champion's colleagues commenting that Kelvin is too inconsistent. The next day, the second round begins with the audience divided between betting on Kelvin and Geese. Suddenly, Snape approaches Rick and formally introduces himself to his companions. Rick asks why Snape isn't in the VIP seat, and he explains that he wants to watch the fight between his fiancé and his youngest son up close. Speaking of them, the two competitors meet before the match and Geese says his brother asked him not to mess up his future wife's face. Angelica, eager to show the results of her training, listens as the lizard laughs about spending his father's money on nonsense and still being stronger than his opponents. When she brings up his physique, claiming it's impossible to achieve without training, Geese dodges the accusation, boasting that some people call him a prodigy. Either way, he promises not to crush her so she can still bear Snape's children later. Offended by this insult, Angelica vows to crush him. The clash between them begins with Angelica starting off with a flying kick to Geese's torso, though he barely feels the impact. Unlike Herman, however, Angelica has the speed necessary to avoid taking hits. Realizing that her physical attacks aren't effective against Geese, she cancels her enhancement magic, baffling the entire audience. She then uses magic flow reverse reflection, advances with instant step, and finishes with a new technique she learned, thread cut, where her hand simulates a sword and slices open Geese's belly. This then marks the end of today's anime recap. If you enjoyed the video and want more of it, please support the channel by leaving a like and subscribe. Let's help us reach our current goal of 20k subscribers.